Okay, our next speaker is Alex Thompson, who's going to talk on nation states and the Westphalian order. And uh, Alex is an extremely interesting gentleman who first got in touch with the UK column 2013, thank you, because I can't remember. And he quietly said, would we like some interpretation help? And we thought this was quite interesting. And in fact, shortly after that, uh, one of the articles we did on subversion by the BBC uh, appeared in Russian. Uh, and I think that was pretty well accepted um, in the East. And uh, we got to know each other a bit better. And uh, Alex then turned out to be a man of many talents, of which he spent eight years working for GCHQ. So I'm going to hand over to Alex, and he'll explain his own story. Thank you very much. The fact that you're all still alive and with us at this point in the day testifies to the quality of the information and also to your stickability. I'm glad that we're also determined to uh, carry this determination through uh, and see this movement through to the next phase. So that's why I'm giving you a mini history lecture this afternoon. I'm actually going to give you two talks for the price of one because I would not be able to rattle through my slides. So instead, you can see the slides in the video that God willing will be produced and you can freeze phrase them. Instead, I'll be picking out highlights and illustrations of what's on the slides. Don't struggle to read every word, you can do so afterwards. I may even produce an article series on the British Constitution Group website as well out of these themes. As a young GCHQ officer, I got invited to Chatham House talks, and these are not open to the general public. You have to be among the great and the good. In the case of the secret agencies, that's uh, a corporate membership through the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Now, Chatham House is described in Carol Quigley's uh, book, uh, which was mentioned earlier today, Tragedy and Hope, and poses as the FCO's think tank, although, in fact, uh, it's the tail that wags the dog rather than the other way round. If you go to St. James's Square, that desirable piece of real estate in the West End, uh, to Chatham House, you will find in the middle of that square, behind railings, although accessible, is a statue of King William III, the uh, king of the Netherlands under that name, uh, or the Stadthouder at least of the Netherlands, and then King William III in Britain. We've heard two very persuasive talks today, majoring on that date of 1688. And it's quite, very significant that King Billy is uh, glowering across the square at Chatham House as if he was about to charge on his trusty steed and knock the building down. King Billy and the glorious revolution of 1688, we've heard two, I would, I would say, not contradictory, but complementary presentations today. And they correspond to what historically are known as the Whig or Protestant version of history, and the Roman Catholic version of history. And having lived in the Netherlands a few years now, and having previously been an Orangeman, well, I gave that up when I emigrated, I have to say I'm in sympathy with both sides. History isn't everyone's cup of tea, but it all comes down to the difference between personalities and principles. What did King William do in 1688? And that's one of the steps along the way to our nation statehood. So, John Bingham talked about... Um, King William and uh, his, progress, his promises to progress our nation-statehood, and then we heard from David Pidcock about the letdown, the, uh, the treason that happened behind our backs when King William came over. Why does it matter? Why do we need to know what a nation-state is? Well, I think the simplest way to answer, I'm not going to rattle all that off, is this. Most of you now have heard <clears throat> about Melanie Shaw and about the Doherty family. Why is it that we feel an innate empathy and sympathy with those victims of the system? It's because we understand the institutions which persecuted them, institutions which we have paid into with our taxes, institutions which, if we are believers of any kind, we have prayed for and, under, and accepted as the powers that be ordained of God. If we hear about people being persecuted in another country, we feel sorry for them on a human level. Uh, we can be moved if we read Alexander Solzhenitsyn, for example. But it doesn't affect us in the way that we, it does when we hear about a Tom Crawford or a Melanie Shaw or a Brian and Janice Doherty. We come out on the streets and write to our uh, representatives, supposedly in Parliament, for those who are in our own nation because we have the same, uh, share the same frame of reference. That's why people came out saying, I am Tom Crawford, and writing to the prisons where Melanie Shaw was held, and now, I hope, writing on behalf of the Doherty's. 
In short, we've got the 950th anniversary this year that's just closing of the Norman Conquest, which more than any other date brought about a nation state of first England and then Britain and the United Kingdom. The question's very much if we're going to, those of us who are going to be alive in 50 years' time, not many in this room because of the average age, uh, but those of us who are alive then or our children, are we going to have a nation state in 2066 to see the millennium of the founding of, of the, the United Kingdom, shall we say, the, the, the unified kingdom of England in its, in its uh, modern state. Uh, it depends on the robustness of our nation state. If that all sounds a bit dry to you, put it even more simply, what goes through your mind and more particularly through your gut when you hear the phrase, the British nation? The last speaker, but one, David Pidcock, uh, quoted what was very, very routine in those days when the text was written, the other phrase, the British race. That is not a racialist state, it's just a, a, a con an old way of saying the British nation. Why don't we say that anymore? Why does that make you think of Enoch Powell or people like that if you hear it? It's because we've been told that nationalism and the nation state are of the past. Clearly, someone does not like our being a nation state. You've been hearing enough indications today that the uh, root of uh, the dislike for nation states is in particular banking interests. But nation states continue to be a reality. At the breakfast table today, I found myself sitting opposite a lady uh, who I didn't know from Adam, but when I said I was going to be speaking, uh, by the way, she's from Plymouth and she'd heard of UK Column News. It seems a lot of people have down there now. When I said I'd be speaking about King William and his pledge to maintain the liberties of England, she nodded with an impulsive nod and said, yes, and we must maintain those. That's the essence of a nation state. If that can be broken up, if we regard ourselves simply as inhabitants of our region or of Europe or the world, we don't have any defenses left and there won't be any more rallying around the Crawfords or the Doherty's or the Melanie Shaw's of this world. What is a nation state? I haven't got the time to go through the theory. Uh, oceans of ink have been spilled about it, but in essence, it's not enough to be a nation or to be a state. There are many nations in the world which are nev have never been states and haven't a hope of being them because they're too small, they're tribes, or they're too scattered like the Kurds. There are other states in the world which are not nations. They are artificial. But there are such things as nation states. I got my own definition here at the foot of the slide. It's, I would say it is a people that makes its nationhood abiding and protected by establishing its statehood, laws, and customs, crucial part of the 1688 settlement, its customs, still in the coronation oath, by its constitution. Many thinkers down the ages in many countries, starting from ancient Greece, have said that the nation is in fact the largest entity in which you can be altruistic. You can do things for people you don't personally know because they share your values, your institutions, your hopes, your education, your history. Uh, not necessarily your blood, physically, but you feel at one with them. It's also the largest scale on which an undertaking can be successful. In the case of a powerful nation and a truly, what, what truly is a nation, such as the United States, these undertakings can be absolutely massive, or the Russian Federation, or the People's Republic of China. For good or ill, these are massive undertakings. They succeed because they have a nation state behind them. The European Union and the United Nations try to do the same and it falls flat on its face. They don't have a people, a nation state behind them. Those are the threats, but I don't need to list those because I've heard um, a beautiful summary of it today. If you replace a nation state and its laws, common law, God's law, we all agree on that today that there is such a thing as God's law. Everyone would give a different definition, but we feel instinctually that there is such a thing. If you replace that with man-made, changeable laws, uh, which take no regard to nationhood, customs, and experience, which we call civil law, then we heard the definition earlier that that is poor mortar. It doesn't bind the house of the nation together. To use a biblical phrase, it's loose plaster. I live on the continent now, and in all those countries there is no common law codified. There is explicitly only civil law, and you can see those nations falling apart. They despise the very nation elite, at an elite level of the nation state. But I've been asked to talk about the nation state and the Westphalian order. So in the latter 10 minutes, what is the Westphalian order? Well, I can't summarize a millennium, but I've got some points here. This is what, the, what we led up to. 
uh, in the millennium up to 1648 when the Peace of Westphalia was signed. Britain was not a direct participant in Westphalia. It was first and foremost a peace treaty for the continent. We had our peace treaty for these islands in 1688. We've heard about it today, the Declaration of Rights. The Continentals didn't have that, but they needed international peace, and they signed it in 1648. But we can at least think, what was our path to nation statehood, distinct from the continent? Well, it's a very ancient concept that a nation state has its own laws and that these are unchangeable. Um, my, my subject at Cambridge was Anglo-Saxon, Norse and Celtic, one of those weird and wonderful subjects only uh, available in a few places. And uh, through that, if you uh, look at the texts, medieval Welsh texts, uh, especially one called Trioedd and Isprydain, the triads of the island of Britain, you will see that even by the Middle Ages they were codified what were already ancient understandings that there were unchangeable set things uh, for a nation universal laws, and that some were particular and recognized by only one nation. These built the nation state. And as European civilization reached its apogee in the high Middle Ages, a very much more sophisticated era than most people think, I'm talking about the years around 1200 or so, and as the exchange of learning and ideas spread and commerce, men began to demand accountability of their rulers, with Britain in the lead, particularly England. We're here in Winchester. King Alfred uh, had been much before that, the 800s. Uh, but by the 1200s, this had gone so far that we had um, a nation demanding accountability of its leaders. In England, that takes the form of Magna Carta 1215. In Scotland, the Declaration of Our Broth that David will be talking about. Henry II takes the lead in England. The kings of Scots follow the lead. I've already mentioned that England and Scotland, together with Denmark and France, are ancient nation states. They were well ahead of the pack, which is why we had our civil war first before the continent and got things sorted. So we had an early and unique path to nationhood. We've got our flag down here today. You can see that it's the emblem of saints. Some uh, were actually uh, apostles of Christ and others were even legendary figures, but they stand for the nation being under God's law. No two speakers who've been on this podium today would agree on the finities of God's law. I don't mean theologically, I just mean practically. But we do agree that there is such a thing as unchangeable God-given right and immutable entitlements and immunities. And that's why uh, we're so concerned now to hear uh, so-called defenders of the Enlightenment claim that the modern fight in the state is between these absolutist Muslims who believe in God's given law and the others whom we're told we should, we should be in that camp believing in man-made law. I have to say that's wrong and that if we don't have our God-given law we don't have any kind of nation at all. We just have despotism. There was uh, a summary of uh, the state of ancient nation statehood and its laws uh, made by the Welsh antiquary Yolo Morganug around 1800. Usually if you look him up, he's derided as a forger, but even if he used his own words, he was accurately in his role as a senior bard summarizing what the British, particularly the Britonic peoples, the, the Welsh as it were, uh, in an ancient form, believed to be the, the law of the land, the common law of our nation. And those are some of the triads which Yolo Morgano, yes, using his own language circa 1800, writing in English, but he summarized from the old Welsh sources what our law involved, what made us a nation state. Look how modern they are. Three tests, he called them, or, or touchstones, if you, uh, between brackets is my uh, modern word to help. Three tests of civil liberty, equality of rights, equality of taxation, freedom to tr come and go. He's talking about freedom of travel and association. Three causes which ruin a state. Inordinate privilege, that is elitism being tolerated, corruption of justice and national apathy. I know which, I, which of those three I think is the most dangerous, the latter. And three things that are indispensable to a true union of nations, which we, the United Kingdom, are. A union of nation states into a nation state. We need sameness of laws, sameness of rights and sameness of language. What Yolo was summarizing is called the Molmutine laws, and we don't have the absolute proof, but it is thought that he is summarizing the laws of a king called Duinval Moelmid, who ruled at least part of Britain in 400 BC, and that these were codified, at least orally, in the aftermath of a civil war in these islands, something which we didn't have again until the 1640s. So in a sense, you could say that we got 2,000 years almost of uh, peace at least among ourselves as peoples, uh, out of this codification.
That's more of YOLO. Now, we're going to quicken the pace. What happened in the century leading up to Westphalia? Well, those bullet points summarize how a man, particularly in Europe and especially in our islands, was progressing and understanding more, uh, investigating more for himself through the technologies of preaching, print, preaching and printing, which had now uh, reached liberty in Britain. Essentially, all these points are about the rediscovery of ancient heritage of the law and the gospel and no longer believing in the divine right of kings. On both sides of the great continental war which led to the Peace of Westphalia, you had religious authorities uh, behind the scenes st uh, stoking up dissent within their own nations. On the Catholic side, the Jesuits, and on the Protestant side, well, you could say forces uh, within the Swedish army, which was, uh, you know, uh, working up its way towards being a great big bully boy. Effectively, the Swedes won the Thirty Years' War, and Protestants were told that was a great victory for uh, biblical liberty and so on, but it, there was a lot of dark stuff going on on the, um, the Protestant side as well. People were being forced, really, to, uh, uh, to bow the knee to uh, princes who claimed absolute power under God in a way that their forefathers would never have accepted. That's what the Peace of Westphalia resolved. The Thirty Years' War on the continent is what uh, led to the, the Peace of Westphalia. There was also an Eighty Years' War, a multi-generational war between the new nation of the Netherlands and the Habsburg kings who still claimed rule over the Netherlands. And in the case of Germany, which is where the Thirty Years' War was fought, people were burning their neighbours alive, torturing them to death in horrendous ways. And this is what caused a permanent st swing to statism in Germany and out of a sense that we must have order or we will revert to butchering each other again. You can see that these banking and religious interests behind the scenes are pushing people towards absolutism and pushing them towards the idea that if you're not on that enemy side, if you're not a Catholic, for example, if you're not a Jew, then you must be under our authority. And then that gives the way, that paves the way to absolutism. Finally, the Europeans have had enough they decide to get out from under the power of the respective dark forces, the Jesuits and the, uh, the militarists of the Protestant side, and they sign a peace treaty from which we get the famous line, there shall be a Christian and universal peace. There's over 120 articles in this peace of Westphalia, and it's brought in a system of peace and diplomacy, which is still, well, it's on its last legs in a sense, but it's, it's still with us today. There'd been previous attempts to do this, Cardinal Wolsey, you might have heard about at school, effectively the Prime Minister of England under Henry VIII, uh, he tried to, in 1518, to sign a Treaty of London between the European powers. And the idea was that because the Turks were at the door, all so-called Christian empires would team together to resist the Ottomans. But it failed because Russia was not invited to sit at the table. It was called Muscovy back then, and it was regarded as not a European power. And then to end the war between the Lutherans and the Roman Catholics in Germany, in 1555 there had been a treaty or a peace of Augsburg, which coined this famous expression, cuius regio eus religio, whoever holds the territory, his religion. That sounds like it's forcing people back into absolutism and denying uh, nations, but nothing of it. What it means is that if you are in a certain territory, and you may have to move to a certain territory to find one that accords with your values, you are then guaranteed to live in peace under them and there won't be any interventionism. We heard from Vanessa today about interventionism. That is, the British government claiming that there are certain kinds of Syrians who need our help. You might have it, have it presented to you as the fate of persecuted religious minorities. The Gulf Arab states are using the same uh, pretext to, invade in Syria, to intervene in Syria and other countries. Our co-religionists uh, are in danger. But this is excluded by the Peace of Westphalia, that there should no longer be any interventionism between nations. Instead, to quote the treaty, there should be a perpetual, true and sincere amity, meaning friendship, between the nation states. So what we had was a situation of arbitration, renunciation of extraterritorial claims, that very thing that the British government is now doing in Syria and around the world, we renounced, or, or the powers that signed Westphalia, uh, and that includes Britain because it's the foundation of a treaty system which we're now adhering to, those nations agreed not to use extraterritorial claims to increase their jurisdiction or power, and an, a pledge of non-interference. That was effectively an internationalization of the rule of law, the theme with which we began today. 
So there's a summary of, for you of what was established uh, by the Peace of Westphalia, by those documents, the Treaty of Osnabrück and the Treaty of, of Münster. The most important to the top line, we had international treaty-based diplomacy making a reappearance after 3,000 years, precisely 3,000 years of absence. The whole of the Greek and Roman classical period, the whole of biblical history period, had no such thing as diplomacy through peaceful means. Uh, there were periods of the Pax Romana, the Roman peace, but that was established by force in an empire that had nothing to do with nation states. We now know because of having dug up a cache of clay tablets in Egypt, the Amarna letters, that there was a fully fledged system of international diplomacy uh, between all the kings of the civilized world from 2300 BC to 1300 BC, which was a much more prosperous and peaceful period than the century, than the millennium that followed it. That was due to the recognition of nation states and the nation states through their kings saying to each other, we will not invade you, we will not intervene in your internal affairs and we will uh, respect each other's liberties and laws and customs. That disappeared in 1300 BC and it didn't come back till 1648. This is the seriousness of what a nation state is and what the Peace of Westphalia has all, all to do about. Treaties, this is the bottom point on my slide here as well. Treaties were... Uh, well, they had existed before 1648, but the point was in 1648, the model was re-established. If you have a dispute with another nation, sign a treaty with them. If Her Majesty's government has any real beef with the powers in Syria, it must sign a treaty with them under this system. Uh, it established a precedent which allowed the English-speaking nations to grow. We all know about the hideous ways in which the native peoples of what's now the United States of America were massacred because the treaties with them were not honoured. But there were plenty of other examples where they were honoured. In Canada, for example. In New Zealand, where Waitangi Day is, is marked as the birth of the nation in 1840 because of a, a treaty of the Westphalian model signed between the British colonists and the Maori people. And that has successfully formed the core of this, that English-speaking nation to this day. And I mentioned on a previous slide, New Zealand, thanks to that, is one of the nations which never saw an overthrow of common law and its nation statehood at any time during the 20th century. Only the five core English-speaking countries, UK, US, Canada, Australia and New Zealand, did so with the possible inclusion of South Africa, which had a repressive regime, and Sweden and Switzerland, which had to forge dirty compromises with Nazi money in order to do so. So nation statehood saves lives. It can save millions of lives if you get it right, if you uh, codify the uh, understanding of laws and customs. Australia still doesn't have a treaty between the indigenous people and the settlers, and there's been quite a lot of talk that they should, especially in 1988 at the bicentenary. It shows that the abiding power of the, uh, of the treaty model to solve disputes but I think this is the most important slide in my talk, with which I'm nearly finishing, and that is what went wrong in Britain after the signing of the Treaty of Westphalia. Well, I've been speaking a lot about religious liberty, and that is because those of all religious persuasions and none will agree that religious liberty is a bellwether, the bellwether, of civil and political liberty. We saw that expressed earlier today in the Declaration of Rights, that we need to be maintained by the Crown in our spiritual and civil liberties. Civil follows the spiritual liberties. We did not do that. This is where the two wings of what we were told about William earlier in the day come together. Yes, there was a Williamite settlement. Yes, it was a glorious revolution. It was a largely bloodless revolution. Yes, it led to the reassertion through a peace treaty again with the monarch, with William, that we had laws and customs, that we were a nation state without any reference to crown or parliament, and that's why the crown and parliament existed for us. But William III did not do what he promised. He sailed to Brixham in Devon and landed there, and the first words on landing were, the liberties and Protestant religion of England, and later he became King of Scotland too, uh, by the same token, but he said that liberties and, and um, uh, Protestant religion of England, I will maintain. And he did not do so. He, he allowed himself and his government to go back to the absolutism of the Stuarts, who had been restored in 1660. Uh, it, the, yes, there was an end to the persecution of certain kinds of Christian in Scotland, an end to the killing times, but there was not much of a relaxation of England's Clarendon Code, which prevented all manner of preachers and speakers from speaking freely. That went on through the 18th and 19th century. Perhaps people aren't aware how many preachers and political orators were put in prison, even in England, but more particularly in Scotland, through those years, because William dishonoured his undertaking, and so did his heirs and successors in the House of Hanover. 
Look at the Williamite settlement in detail. He didn't issue an act of religious and civil liberty when he came to the throne. He called it a toleration act. What does that tell you? It tells you that it's expected of everyone to be an Anglican of a certain kind, but you're tolerated if you have any kind of dissent. Not a very positive model, is it? There was also a mutiny act. Mutiny is not a common law offence. It was a continental concept, because to mutiny under common law is simply to, to disobey a, an unconstitutional order. And above all, we had the abuse of royal prerogative. We're going to be hearing a lot more about royal prerogative in the Brexit saga as it spins out. The point is royal prerogative is the sovereign acting out with parliament in the name of the people, but delegating that to ministers. That is the root of the evil in the matter. If the Queen or any serving monarch delegates that to ministers, we have royal prerogative devolving into parliamentary prerogative. We have the divine right of parliament, in fact. We've thrown off one tyrant in order to get a bunch of tyrants back. We heard that William Pitt warned the Lords against that. Royal prerogative can be used under the fig leaf, for example, of having a parliamentary vote or even having a referendum these days. It was in 1972 when Edward Heath treasonously, and because he was being blackmailed, took us into the European economic community, although that was unlawful under the Treaty of Vienna, under the very Westphalian system itself, because it was done under duress and with party interests in the matter. Even so, Heath promised that there would be a vote in Parliament on the matter. I understand that there were fisticuffs in the lobbies on that night in 1972, and only with a bare majority of eight did the bill go through. But the point is, even with the fig leaf of a bill, it was unconstitutional, and it was an exercise of royal prerogative, which the monarch ought personally to have done and been accountable to for her, for, to her people, and she didn't. I'll cut some of the things I was going to say now, but just to close, there are certain kinds of people, particularly those who go by the Bible, who think that nation statehood is either outdated or, or wrongfully nationalistic, or that uh, nations are, have been responsible for evil in the world, and there are others who say that you should be subject to any powers that be, and who go further with Paul's words in Romans 13 than they should, uh, in being subject to any power that presents itself and says, I am an absolute authority. Well, both testaments of the Bible do establish that there are such things as nations and that they appoint and dismiss their rulers. Christ himself gives the parable of the ten talents in Luke 19. And without criticizing in telling the parable, without criticizing the people who did so, uh, tells a story, this happened in real life, by the way, in first century Roman Empire times, of a people who were given a king and said, we will not have this man to rule over us. It's very emphatic in the Greek, ou thelomen tuton basileusai ephemas. We will not, we do not want this man to rule over us. Christ, by telling that parable, approves of such a course of action. If you have unsuitable rulers, we do have a right of resistance. And in the Old Testament, we see that a son of Solomon who promises openly to tyrannize the people and take away their laws and customs and threaten their nation's statehood is deposed at his coronation. We see that the people of Israel gathered together refused to acclaim that king, Rehoboam. Our constitution since 1688 has very much emphatically said that we need um, to have an election of the sovereign by the means of popular acclaim. It isn't enough for a king or queen to be of the rightful succession and sign the right documents. The people have to turn out on coronation day and hail and approve what the liturgy for the coronation, oath, uh, the coronation service calls the undoubted queen. She's presented to the people. If you look for the British Pathé, P-A-T-H-E, British Pathé uh, coverage on YouTube of the coronation, part one, type in Pathé Coronation 1953 and you'll find it. At six minutes, you will see the Queen bow to the gentlemen, it's particularly the men of the nation who need to do this or do, to be present. She bows to them to acknowledge that they are appointing her Queen. Now, when you live on the continent, as an expat, you have a lot of sleepless nights sometimes wandering and worrying about the fate of the country, but things also strike you with renewed clarity. Some thoughts are not thinkable once you're in Britain or while you're in Britain, but when you go abroad, they become thinkable. One is that Her Majesty is not long or for this world. She's 90 years old. Many people want to honor her for the rest of her reign for what we, some of us think is uh, having put a lot of brakes on what, what would otherwise have been a, a lot more evil. Others are deeply disappointed in her, but I think we can all agree that when she's called home, there will be an unmissable opportunity for us not to acclaim her heir and successor, although he be according to law, and although he sign and approve all the oaths, that we say with the Israelites of old, to your tents, 
O Israel. That was the cry in Hebrew, la aholecha, meaning go home. Don't give any legitimacy to this coronation ceremony. I suggest that that's what we do and that we use the words of the Israelites of old and say that we have no proportion, no portion nor inheritance in the house of Saxe-Coburg-Gotha. I think that we need national repentance and I think that we need to throw off that house. And I think we need a second element in the spirit of 1215 and 1648 and 1688 and that is a new peace treaty with whoever the new sovereign will be. And based on the experience of history, because these peace treaties are cumulative and build in the knowledge that we've built up over the centuries of how abuses are perpetrated, I think there needs to be a new element in a new peace treaty before a new sovereign from a new house is appointed to rule us. Not, it's not sufficient anymore to undertake that we're going to be ruled by our laws and customs because we have seen that international law and royal prerogative have been misused woefully since the enemy got a chance to do so through this treaty-based system. So I suppose, and I propose, that we will need to put in that treaty that juries will be told before every trial that they, must, that they may and must nullify unconstitutional statutes not in accordance with our common law. I also believe we need term limits. Thank you. Also based on the philosophy that the unwilling people who are worthy to represent us almost have to be dragged to Westminster, I propose that we have term limits strictly enforced for only one term for members of parliament. How many of you have heard of the MP David Lammy? You know he's a trained lawyer, don't you? Yes, he is. He, he claims to be a big shot lawyer in a, in a previous uh, existence before he went into parliament. Did you know that he said this week that he would be voting against the repeal of the European Communities Act and against the invoking of Lisbon Treaty, Treaty Article 50? And what was the reason he gave? He said, this is all, you know, um, talking out the, uh, uh, the wrong orifice, but he, he, he feels able to say it. He said that members of parliament in Britain are not delegates. In other words, they don't have the fiduciary duty which we know that they had, which Max told us about earlier. He said, no, we vote on our consciences as MPs. That's wrong. We can't elect party men to Parliament. We need to hear their platforms. That involves us going out to hustings, as we used to do until about the 1950s, hearing the candidates and requiring them beforehand to vote in certain ways. If their conscience doesn't allow them to vote genuinely in a certain way that's in the national interest, let them resign and give their seat to another who will follow orders. There was a lot of theory in that, time for me to close, and I'm going to do so in a slightly unexpected manner for some of you, and that is this. The Doherty family had the horrendous things perpetrated upon them that you can read about on the UK Column website, and these things happened to them in a Scots village called Crimmond, or at the estate nearby called Crimmond Mogate. If the name Crimmond is familiar to any of you, it is because it is the name of the psalm tune to which we sing Psalm 23. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me down to lie in pastures green. In other words, that unspeakable approach made to uh, take a small disabled boy for abuse was done in the place which gives its name to that beautiful psalm tune, the most famous part of the Bible that's ever been sung. So I propose that we reclaim Psalm 23 and the name Crimmond as we've reclaimed our flag today. And I'm going to do so by singing two verses of that famous psalm, which are on the next slide. Anyone who wishes to join with me is welcome to stand and sing with me. Please sing the harmonies if you wish. <laughs> 